One of the most fascinating aspects of the Mughal period is the range of sources that it offers to the scholar of history. Dominating this entire range is the prolific work of Abul Fazl, court historian and imperial chronicler. In the earlier part of this program series, we had delved into his work, Akbar Nama, perhaps the most significant Persian language historical source in Indian history. We had examined the methods and the methodologies of history writing, looking at the novel techniques that he employed to write the history of Mughal rule. There were a few occasions when Abul Fazl was critical of Akbar. But in a larger sense, his mandate was clear. A court historian idealizing his patron and elevating him to a semi-divine status. This was in stark contrast to the views of the orthodox Islamist historian Abdul Qadir Badawni, who was contemptuous of Akbar's liberal religio-cultural views. Abul Fazl's classmate was Abdul Qadir Badawni, who wrote this Muntakhabul Tabarik. Badawni was also the student of Abul Fazl's father, Sheikh Mubarak. But unlike Abul Fazl, Badawni became a very orthodox man but I would say rather enigmatic man. He was a fundamentalist, if we call it in modern parlance, believing in the outer rituals of Islam, but very well learned in Islamic theology. He knew Sanskrit very well. He was, a, was an excellent mathematician. He knew Indian astrology. He knew Indian music. He knew Persian music. And he could play Satranj, the earlier Indian version of chess, modern chess, very well. Now, Badawni refused to be a Mansabdar when Akbar offered him. So, Akbar asked him to translate three uh, books from Sanskrit, Batrishi Singhasan, Ramayana and Mahabharata, which he did very reluctantly, stating very clearly that he did not like to do this because these are the religious books of the Kafis. Now, Badawni has a grievance against Akbar because Abul Fazl had rose so high and he had not that kind of a position. So, he stated and he showed with uh, some evidences that Akbar was trying to destroy Islam, that Akbar was against Islam, he had left Islam, he, he was trying to dis destroy Islam. This was the line that was taken by Vincent Smith in the 20th century in his book, Akbar the Great Mughal. And this had caused quite a bit of controversy. Happily, it has died down now, because now it has been established that Akbar did not leave Islam at all. He remained, although one might say that he believed in toleration, but he remained in Islam. He has his own personal view of Akbar's empire and a personal interpretation of history. He is very hostile to the idea that why Akbar's empire is not a theocracy, why it is not an Islamic empire. And he sees most of the things with this eye and criticizes them. But he is accurate as far as history is concerned, events are concerned. His interpretation of the same event will be different. But 
suppose uh, Akbar decides that all the land grants should be confined into few um, villages or earmarked areas, Abul Fazl will say it is for the sake because these land grantees are troubled by the zamidars and the jagirdars. Badayuni shamelessly will tell you, because on the strength of the same document, the grantees were going to different, small grantees were going to different places and getting the land at different places. While they were supposed to take at one place, they were showing it at different places. Just to do away with this practice, these, these got consolidated at one place, so you can't duplicate your uh, grant from one place to another. And that, therefore, this is a very wrong measure, a harsh measure, harsh against the ulamas or the divines. Or. So you have a different interpretation, but the narration of the event, the date and other things are. Another merit of um, Badayuni is that he gives you, he really takes you into the era about which he is writing. All gossip, all how people used to live, how he himself fell in love, how the nobles were acting. He really brings the period before your eyes. He will give you all details of those sort of things. How Akbar decided that um, on the wine shops, women should be the main salesperson because if a woman is standing there, then the men behaves a little better. So you know the social history without that really being said very explicitly, but you can understand the society, which is implicit what he is talking about. He writes another book, najat -e rashid where he appears a different person, where uh, he criticizes that why Muslims have more than one wife, and he praises Hindus that they only are loyal to one wife. He says, look at these uh, Muslims, they think the only, the only pious act is to keep on uh, filling their stomach with, the bee, with beef or with meat. Why couldn't they live normally? So all those sort of criticisms and other things you find in najat -e rashid a very good book on what you will say, akhlaqiyat and ethics of the period. So this is another interesting aspect of what I mean. The sheer range of Badawni's writing is impressive. But the book that has immortalized him is a three-part Muntakab ut Tawarik. The first part is a history of the Delhi Sultanate. The second part looks at the 40 years rule of Akbar. The third part, known by the genreic name Tadskirat, looks at important contemporaries from diverse backgrounds. Here he angrily excludes the grandees of Akbar's court as he considered them as corrupting influence on the emperor's religious views. There are other influential but less controversial historians who have dominated history writing during Akbar's reign. The other person who wrote during the time of Akbar was Nizamuddin, who Nizamuddin Ahmad, who was the Bakshi of the Mughal Empire. He wrote Tabakati Akbari. This is a straightaway political history. The only point in perhaps in favor, if one would look at it from that point of view, that he did not get himself involved in the religious debates. In Tapkati Akbari, he deals with each region at least from the 12th century onwards. And because he is, doesn't know any other language, he knows only Persian, so he can't go beyond 12th century but 12th century onwards, until it merges or mingles in the Mughal Empire by being conquered by Akbar. So Tapkat means regions. So all regions of India, including parts of South India and Gujarat and Dakin are dealt with till they become the part of the Mughal Empire. And then in the second volume, he writes about Akbar's India. This is further taken back by Farishta, Abul Qasim Farishta, in his tarikh -e farishta or gulshan -e ibrahimi the other correct name for it, where he gives you a very inaccurate, sketchy history of peninsular India, Malabar and Kerala and other places. But in spite of that, whether the history is accurate or inaccurate, because he has no sources, he doesn't know, didn't know Sanskrit, 
there is now India as India there. Parts which have not come under the control of the Mughal Empire, all are so part of India. So you can envision India in that part of the part of history. The prolific writing of history that happened during Akbar's rule slowed down during the rule of his son and successor Jahangir. The most significant work of this period was the imperial autobiography tuzuk e jahangiri or Jahangir Nama, which gave some interesting glimpses of the times. Objective history writing flourished again during the rule of Shah Jahan, Akbar's grandson. Shah Jahan ascended the throne in 1628 after the death of Jahangir and he immediately ordered that a book should be written, book on history should be written of his reign which would surpass Abul Fazal Sakbar Nama. For this purpose two historians were appointed, Jalaluddin Taba Tabai was one and Muhammad Amin Kazwini another. They worked for many years from the archives and wrote two volumes. The third volume they could not complete, which they had planned. This was completed by another person named Muhammad Waris. Padshah Nama, as this book was called, was meant to match Akbar Nama in scope and importance. The arbitrary change of dating system by Shah Jahan, ostensibly under pressure from orthodox ulemas, made the rewriting of Padshah Nama unavoidable. Abdul Hamid Lahori's profile as a man of faith made him an ideal candidate for the job. Three different historians write about different period. Um, Kazwini writes for the first 10 years. Then Lahori goes back to the entire period, first 20 years, and then Waris, the last third, 10 years. One doesn't know why Shah Jahan's Kazwini is stopping writing and Lahori is again writing that. One reason given is that Shah Jahan changed the era from the Ilahi era, which was solar, to Hijri era, which was um, lunar. So all dates have to be converted and Kazwini last all concerned with that and he stopped writing and Lahori gave both the era and continued to write. So perhaps one doesn't know whether this was the reason. Another reason assigned is that Shah Jahan started changing his religious policy from the 10th regnal year and Lahori wrote in a different manner. But Lahori is again following Akbar Nama, not as difficult a language as that of and courtly a language as that of uh, Abul Fazl not so magnificent, but is still a courtly language. <laughs> Now, Shah Jahan's later years, we know, are full of troubles. The civil war between Dara and Aurangzeb, and the historians had also taken different views on the subject. There were people who were for Aurangzeb, there were people who were for Dara. In the factricidal war that ensued between Shah Jahan's two sons, Aurangzeb emerged victorious and eventually ascended the Mughal throne. Aurangzeb's orthodox religious belief and his perceived 
anti-Hindu stance has always been a highly contested area of Indian history. For Aram Seb, there was Muhammad Qasim who wrote Alamgi Nama. And later on, there was another one, Saki Mustad Khan, who wrote Masiri Alamgiri, which has been translated by Jadunath Sarkar into English and published by the Asiatic Society of Calcutta. Saki Mustad Khan's uh, Masiri Alamgiri is actually almost a gazetteer. He had given the promotions, demotions uh, of officials, uh, the breaking of temples, this, that and so on and so forth. Now, Aurangzeb's reign is full of controversy and I may present here two such controversies and the present opinion of the historians. One is the view of uh, Jodhanath Sarkar and S. R. Sharma. They said that the civil war in the civil war between Dara and Aurangzeb the Hindus had taken the part of Dara and the Muslims had taken the part of Aurangzeb. Arthur Ali of Aligarh Muslim University, who is now dead, he had shown by statistical information that both the Hindus and the Muslims, the number remaining the same in both sides. Therefore, this argument of Jadunath Sarkar and Esa Sharma does not hold good. There is the second controversy that Aurangzeb was a Hindu hater. He has taken measures against the Hindus and he did not recruit Hindu nobles. Arthur Ali had shown this is exactly the opposite. During the reign of Aurangzeb, the largest number of Hindus were taken as Mansabdas if we take the reigns of all the Mughal emperors. That the Marathas were taken as Mansabdas instead of the Rajputs, which was the earlier policy of Akbar. So the Rajputs were disregarded, relegated into the background, which they did not like, and the Marathas were taken as Mansabdas. Whether they did the service for the Mughal emperor, that is a different story. But the fact remains that one could say that during the later years, last 20 years of Aurangzeb's life, Aurangzeb was against the Rajputs, but he was for the Marathas. So therefore, that controversy is solved at the moment. Aurangzeb's reign saw an immense amount of Mughal official documentation. In addition to the official histories, there were a large number of imperial correspondences in the form of orders, decrees and even letters. During the time of Aurangzeb, we get a large number of other documents, particularly farmans and so on and so forth, with which we come to the next, the farmans, parwanas, sanads and so on and so forth. There are different kinds of farmans, but the one that has been quoted very much is the farman given by Aurangzeb to Rasik Das Karori, a revenue official in Gujarat in 1666, because it lays down the Mughal policy, Mughal state policy on revenue and agriculture. But apart from that, there were other sanads and parwanas and so on and so forth of the provincial governors and others. Apart from these, there were the letters of Aurangzeb, as I have said. In these letters, which are mostly personal, but uh, the letter of the Mughal emperor is always official. For example, I may quote one, give a brief gist of one. Aurangzeb was writing to his grandson, Azimuddin, who was the provincial governor of Bengal, Subadar as they call him during the late 17th and early 18th century. And Aurangzeb, first of all, was asking for mangoes, which he liked very, very much. Then he was saying that you should not sit on the charpai, because people would think that you are the emperor and not myself. You should sit on the ground. These kind of things are written there. 
Now, apart from these letters, there were certain other provincial works, Persian in Persian language. I may refer to, there are several. One is by Mirza Nathan, who was the son of the Subadar Islam Khan in early 17th century Bengal. It is called Baharistani Kaidi. The importance of this book, which has been translated in English from Gohati in 1936 by Dr. M. I. Bora in three volumes. The importance of the book lies in this, that it gives the history of the establishment of the Mughal rule in Bengal, the defeat of the turbulent Jamindars and so on and so forth, other measures taken. The second book that I may mention, almost at the end of the Mughal Empire, at least their power was gone, is written by Ali Muhammad Khan in 1759 from Gujarat, from Ahmedabad actually, who was the last Mughal Devan of Gujarat. It is called Mirati Ahmadi. This gives the history of the Mughals in Gujarat right from the beginning till the end and how the Marathas are gradually coming into the power. During this period, a large number of historical works were undertaken in the provinces under Mughal rule. Some of them throw light on various aspects of the period, often overlooked by court historians. These Persian writings include works by Mughal officers serving in the provinces and tuned to its local reality. And contrary to popular belief, many of these officers were Hindus. So there are different kinds of Persian sources. Then there are three, I might say, two by a Hindu and one by a Muslim. The Hindu one, the first one, is by Ishardas Nagar, a Nagar Brahmin of Gujarat, was a good fighter who fought for Aurangzeb during the Rajput war against the Rathors. He wrote on the war. He wrote on the anti-Hindu measures of Aurangzeb, but did not express his own opinion. He did not give the grievances of the uh, Hindus. He did not say anything about that. The other one was Vimsen Saxena, who was a Kaistha of UP. His father was a government official in Burhanpur, and he wrote from there on the problem of the Marathas and so on and so forth. There too, you have very interesting histories written like Bhimsen's Nuskay Del Kusha. Um, Bhimsen will have an interpretation of the things which he is recording. It is not just narration, but interpretation. I will just give you one example of that. He goes to Dakin uh, with the Aurangzeb's army for the first time sees sea and is very impressed by seeing the huge sea, which he thinks looks like a uh, mountain. But then he looks at the magnificent Vijayanagar empire's temples and he immediately thinks how these temples become possible. And he has an interpretation of his own for that. He is not attributing it to religious zeal of the uh, rulers, but he says, in this country, owing to its climate, the cost of subsistence is very low. People can just live on pulses, curds, and rice, coarse rice. And the productivity is very high. This is a very fertile land. So the rulers can collect much higher land revenue. Since they collect higher revenue, they have money enough to get these temples built. So the idea that uh, uh, empire has less to do with religion or rulers have less to do with religion, but if there is an economic interpretation of it, follows over there. His loyalty to the Mughal empire continues. His concern is not that jizya, the poll tax, has been imposed on non-Muslims. His concern only is that lakhs are collected, hardly pennies reach the imperial treasury. So you have a loyalty and an interpretation and a view of history, which, is, which might be very narrow, very personal, but it is not just the narration. There are two other language sources we, which we, I might mention. 
one is the old Rajasthani letters from the Mughal court to Rajasthan. Every Mughal court used to have the proceedings in the Darbar openly read of what happened yesterday. And then the Mughal emperor after hearing this said ok and then this is kept in the archives. The vakil of the Rajput Rajas and others some big Jamaidars also were all present in the Darbar and they used to take down this. The most interesting episode that could be found from this is the flight of Shivaji from Agra. And this had been given in detail in this what is known as Akbarat. Later on there were other Akbarats. For example, in the uh, in Bahadur Shah Zafar's time there were Akbarats, uh, etc. the same kind of thing called Akbarat. But this was written in old Rajasthani translated partly by Jadunath Sarkar. Persian language texts dominate Mughal historiography, but there are other Indian language sources that have proved to be invaluable. Many are yet to be translated and utilized by historians. These documents can surely bring in more valuable insights into the study of Mughal history. The other language source, which has not yet been explored in full, is the Maratha source. Some of the documents had been translated by Surendranath Sen and Jain Sarkar, Jadunath Sarkar, and some others by Sardesai. But the principal volume still remains unexplored, unpublished, and untranslated. This gives the full history, some of which had been seen by Jadunath Sarkar uh, with the help of Sardesai gives the full history of the decline of the Mughal Empire in the second half of the 18th century and the rise of the Maratha power. So therefore, for the study of the Mughal period, one would have to look to various sources. And one of these, as we would see next day, the European sources for the study of the Mughal period. <laughs> Good night.